Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, I want to personally welcome you to the first rebranded episode of mm -hmm. Brains with Brian. And this is a monthly series where we're talking to world experts in the field of neurology, research, rehabilitation, and music, and discussing all things from digital therapeutics to music and neuroscience and rehabilitation. Each month, we feature a new expert who will provide valuable insight into these important topics. And this show is hosted by me, Brian Harris, the co-founder and CEO of MedRhythms. And we're a digital therapeutics company focusing at the intersection of neuroscience, music, and technology to build interventions that will transform the lives of those living with neurologic disease and injury. If you want to learn more about MedRhythms, please visit our website at www.medrhythms.com. I hope that you'll find today's episode interesting, meaningful, and compelling. And I believe that you will. Uh, today, I'd like to introduce our esteemed guest and good friend of mine, Dr. Ron Hirschberg. And he is a physician who specializes in neurological and trauma functional recovery. He's an assistant professor of physical medicine and rehabilitation at Harvard Medical School and the director of PM&R consultation service at Mass General Hospital. Outside of the medical school, uh, Dr. Hirschberg is a musician, has written and produced three albums, including a 2016 Acadia National Park documentary. Shout out to Maine. Right, Ron? Thank you. Um, the way life should be. He also co-hosts the award-winning Boston-based podcast, Above the Basement, that discusses music as it relates to social justice, health, and wellness. Uh, Dr. Hirschberg was the chair of the new division of the Arts and Neuroscience Group at the American Congress of Rehab Medicine, uh, which he co-founded in 2016, demonstrating with, on, with, with I, thank you, Ron, yes, we kind of funded together, um, and uh, with ongoing music and medicine scientific collaborations with criti critically acclaimed artists such as Ben Folds and Beth Nielsen Chapman. He has a variety of other accolades and things that he's involved with from home base to uh, working with veterans um, to even having uh, helping to stand up a, a Boston hospital during COVID and all of these things, which I hope we can dive into today. And I'm sure this will be a, a very exciting and interesting talk. So welcome, Ron. It's awesome to have you here today. Brian, thanks so much. My gosh. Uh, it's, it's like, you know, thinking about seeing you on the floors at Spalding five, what, six years ago, mm -hmm. uh, when you came up with uh, the concept behind Med Rhythms, uh, having these initial conversations literally in the hallway with you and getting inspired by your energy already. It's, it's kind of amazing to see this full circle. And I'm very, I'm very uh, happy, uh, ver very honored to be on the initial inaugural, no, the first rebranded Brains with Brian. Yes, which sir. After the coffee right now, my afternoon, I'm I'm, hum I'm, I'm hopeful that I can even have half a brain to share with you today. <laughs> I love it. I'm hopeful that we get at least half as well, Ron. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it is Thank funny you. to see this come uh, full circle. So for pe people that don't know, uh, Ron was actually the very first, I'm pretty sure he was the very first doctor uh, that I ever met at Spalding on day one um, during my time at Spalding Rehab Hospital as a neurologic mu music therapist treating your patients who had traumatic brain injuries. That's right. That's right. We probably, I don't know, shared some delicious Spalding food together and talked about the, the interface of, of music and health I'm and sure how you were going to change the world someday with, with music, which you are. Well, it's together, amazing. Ron, pushing yeah. this forward. Um, and I think that's actually a good, good sort of uh, segue into our first question, which is, you know, your day job, you know, being a mm -hmm. doctor, physiatrist, um, what does that entail? What, what does that look like on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, physiatrist is not an easy word to spell. I've, uh, I, I, I started that in medical school. I had no idea what it was. I went to University of Vermont Med School. I was the only person in the whole class to go into it. Um, but it, it's, it's been around since the 40s, actually. President Roosevelt had a, had a physiatrist for polio. Um, President Kenny, Kennedy had one for his uh, Addison's uh, and, uh, disease and weakness. I say that because it was sort of around the wartime that um, people started to work with soldiers, actually, um, overseas um, with with rehab docs to say mobility and recovery um, go hand in hand. And so the rehab, the physiatrist is like the rehab doc, basically. Um, the other terminology is physical medicine and rehabilitation. Um, or as some of the, uh, um, some people have, have mentioned before, the acronym is PM and R. Not uh, plenty of money and relaxation, which some people have, have that's, that's, that's more like dermatology, but we won't go there right now. 
<laughs> oh, that's awesome, Ron. Thanks for thanks for sending that out for us. And you work across both Spalding and Mass General Hospital. What are the sort of differences between those two? Yes. So Spalding and, and MGH have been connected for many years and partners uh, now M MGB or Mass General Brigham. Uh, Spalding uh, is, is basically one of the premier rehab hospitals in the country. Um, they they um, uh, focus on uh, uh, neurologic trauma, um, new disease like stroke, brain injury, um, amputees, um, uh, spinal cord injury. And so really the goal of Spalding is to get people home, to get, get people to the next and, and to stage of their life and really get quality of life. Mass General, um, as you know, is an acute care, big hospital in, uh, in Boston. And part of my role there is to sort of see those um, injuries and trauma and, neuro and neurological diseases early on in the process, once they've come into the hospital. And we try to set them up for the next stage um, and we do a lot of uh, prognostic conversations with patients and families. Um, we, we look at the, um, the new injury and how that connects to that particular person's life, what they bring to the plate, so to speak, or bring to the injury. And then we work with them and a whole team of people, therapists, um, you know, psychologists, nurses, of course, um, to try to work with them to really to get them to the next, next place. And so as a physiatrist, really... It's really about, as you mentioned, rehabilitation. So getting people back to a life that they knew to get in there, getting them back to, um, you know, wherever their goals are to be. But that starts early on. So physiatry starts, as you mentioned, in the acute hospital, working with some pretty severely injured patients, looking at, well, what does prognosis from here look like in terms of rehabilitation recovery? Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's uh, re recovery starts to happen before people realize sometimes. And so MGH does a good job at, at getting people um, more awake and moving and, uh, and, and, and really pushing them, pushing them a lot to, to make sure that they can start rehab early. And rehab, yeah. as you know, is, is many things, you know, and I'm, I'm looking forward to talk more about this. For years, it's, uh, you know, it's been based on physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy. And as you know, more than anyone, um, neurologic music therapy has been really at the cornerstone, um, uh, thanks to, to music therapists and people like you that have really brought it into more of the, the forefront for neuro rehab. Well, let's, let's dive into that a little bit, um, Ron, from your perspective as a, as a doctor. I know you do a lot of uh, work also in the neuro ICU, so working with the, the more severely impaired uh, patients, you know, ones that uh, have severe traumatic brain injury. Um, that are maybe in a coma or coming out of a coma in a vegetative state, these types of, uh, of, of areas. Can you talk a little bit about that work and you know, making that connection to, to music? That might not be obvious, right? That how could music right. be connected there throughout this journey with these severely Im impaired patients? How does that look from hmm. your perspective? Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's something that music is a stimulus, just like a picture of a relative, a painting that is familiar, a smell that is familiar, um, perhaps a food. As we know, it's, one, it's a sound, so right, it's, it's one of the five senses, and so, uh, or stimuli. So, you know, even before we thought about looking to some of the research and uh, people like you and others and, and uh, lots of folks you've had on this video cast is, you know, even before looking at the science behind this, there's been, you know, decades and decades of, of um, not robust research, but a lot of experience by uh, therapists and clinicians over the years and family members that a stimulus like music can really offer some calming, some orientation, and uh, some familiarity to severely injured people that are in a vegetative state, which we call the un, un, um, un, unwakeful, uh, excuse me, the uh, uh, unwakeful, unwakefulness state uh, syndrome. So, um, so the fact that, that music is a stimulus that really grounds people and connects with them, perhaps give them, gives them a little bit more um, uh, focus or, or uh, wakefulness as well um, is not surprising. There are some, some studies, you know, Wendy, uh, Wendy McGee, who you know, who's over in, um, in Britain, has done some pretty, pretty amazing work with uh, DOC or disorders of consciousness patients with music. And um, so, you know, one of the one of the classic studies we we think about are 
you know, looking at um, 20 people versus 20, pe 20 controls, I think it was 20 very injured brain injury patients and looking at um, music that they, they love, music that they don't like at all and music that um, is live in front of them versus actual white noise yeah. um, where it's just a benign stimulus, sort of like a control. Uh, I think they use silence as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, at the end of the day, they looked at these severely injured pati patients and they saw that the salient or the music that they really loved would give their, would, their heart rate would go up, the respiratory rate would go up. And um, there's actually EEG um, brainwave activity that was increased in this population, um, which wasn't really a major surprise, but it was a pretty cool, amazing finding. Yeah, and I believe in that in that research study too, Ron, they looked at, so that's sort of the, the neural underpinnings here, so some neuroimaging, but they also looked at functional outcomes, things like arousal, uh, and you said physiological arousal, but also things like eye-opening and awareness interaction, interacting with the environment, and they showed that people had higher levels of arousal and awareness in response to live preferred music. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, exactly. Um, yeah, and in, in more recent times, um, our colleague, Brian, another Brian, mm -hmm. um, with a, a very smart brain. Um, yeah. uh, Brian Edlow is a, is a friend and colleague, a big music lover, uh, coincidentally, who is at Mass General. And I was part of this study, and he was really, you know, drove it forward in 2017. Um, and it was uh, published in Brain, actually, uh, mm -hmm. back to the Mm -hmm. And so um, basically looked at coma, vegetative state, and minimally conscious state patients in the acute stage, not chronically, like a lot of other studies have done. And in the ICU, they could see that actually there was a, a, um, a classical music, the same piece they played for every patient. Um, they found that the only, only, the only patients that could not even um, show it on a functional MRI, a lighting up of the brain that it processed some of the music, were the coma patients. Um, you would think the conscious ones or minimally conscious would, would detect it, but also the vegetative patients did too. Um, and so that was, that's an amazing finding. It's also, um, it's also scary at times too, because sometimes you think about well, what does that, what does that mean for some of the diagnostic, what we do in diagnosis? Are we, are we missing, are we perhaps missing people that have a little bit more awareness than we think. Mm -hmm. um, so a whole other conversation, but it's, it's, uh, they've been, suffice to say, music as a stimulus is now used more um, actually for, um, to detect and to diagnose, not only to treat. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, obviously, obviously um, as our, um, as our work as clinicians and working with Spalding, working with some of these patients, um, as they're in a vegetative state, when you think about that research, um, when these patients have such severe brain injuries, and you call it a vegetative state, it means literally their vegetative functions are what, what are working. So heart rate, breathing rate, but that's essentially the extent of what appears to be functioning. That even in that state, there can be a response or an activation to music. It's a really compelling sort of foundation for all the work that we continue to do about how this can be used to help people recover. But even from a very basic level of how it's processed so deeply um, in these patients' brains. Um, and then, as you mentioned, to be able to maybe even flip the script a little bit and say, well, if it's so deeply processed and we, we can activate the brain, perhaps it could be used diagnostically because maybe that's the one area or the one element that can elicit these responses that nothing else can. Um, it's really quite. Yeah. Important. Yeah. As you know, I mean, you know, as I've heard you talk before and 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 certainly in in some of the um the most com the most compelling uh work in music shows that it illuminates all areas of the brain mm -hmm. superficial and deep mm -hmm. and so that's an amazing thing but it's also can be a daunting thing because you know where do you go from there how do you target certain things and i know that that's a whole other you know of interest yeah. of, of the whole pot of the whole you know research teams Yes, and we'll, we'll, we, will, we will dive into that in a little bit. And I think, you know, that's sort of our more severely impaired patients. You work with patients across the spectrum with stroke, PD, MS. I mean, you've done some, you, you've done some research yourself, uh, doing some research. We're collaborating on some research and looking at walking in, in MS. But where do you see the utility for music across your populations in, in the patients you're working with with Parkinson's disease and stroke and MS? 
Yeah, the the most like direct experience I've had is with Parkinson's. And as you know, um, some of the classic RAS or rhythmic auditory stimulation studies come from Parkinson population. Um, and so you all, you, you not only, um, you read about it, you know that therapists get um, good effect of ent with entrainment and, and, and helping um, Parkins Parkinsonian movements more fluid and, uh, and help the gait experience itself. But seeing it is is another um, is another world. So I I've definitely been in the office with people. I'm mostly in in the hospital inpatient, but I've had some outpatient practice where um, you play music in a beat for certain people, and you can actually show that there is you know kind of like a mini entrainment that people can connect with, um, and then at least you can create a spark in them or their loved one to say, okay, well, let's think of something outside the box. Um, I think Parkinsonian, Parkinson's is, is pretty, um, very tangible to, to study because we know that the basal ganglia, which is affected in the Parkinson's, in Parkinson's, um, directly senses a beat. And so, um, there are, there are people that have looked at this to show that, you know, we know this external entrainment of a stimulus comes in and matches that internal rhythm of someone or someone lacking that internal metronome, like in Parkinson's, needs to have that external stimuli, right? Music, the beat. So, um, you know, that to me is the most tangible mechanism where, um, where you have an external stimulus that connects to that, um, that metronome. And uh, yeah, Jessica Gran is the, is the, uh, sort of the guru of this, thinking about where the beat comes from, actually, um, the neuroscientist. Um, but, you know, I think that what's, what I've found that's interesting in learning more about this and working with you and others is that that pathway of motor entrainment can occur, um, but you can affect that pathway in any, any bit of the motor circuit. It's not just the deep basal ganglia, it's the cortex. It's different areas of the cortex. It's the cerebellum. All of that, that, you know, we call the rhythm section, right? That's connected. Um, so anyway, long, uh, kind of a long-winded answer, but Parkinson's more so. Um, MS, uh, the research that you're involved in with med rhythms is really exciting because we're going to look at, we are looking at um, how our, um, music and specifically um, rhythm will help people's gait. Um, and there have been, there's definitely been studies on this, smaller studies, but one of the other things we're adding to this is looking at functional MRI and looking at, can you show what's called functional connectivity? So the areas of the brain that may be affected in MS, there's multiple. And so is there a connectivity that shows that is being affected by the beat or by music? Um, and so that's kind of more of a newer thing. Right. Yeah, it's very, it's fascinating. I mean, when we back up and even talk about, uh, you know, those areas of the brain and within the motor loop, right? So research since the 1970s, as we, as we know, have shown that you can use an external rhythmic cue to prime the motor system. Mm -hmm. And then over uh, the course of the last, you know, 50 years, they've shown that these connections from the, from an external rhythm to the motor system or the auditory motor connections. Because that's really the connection we're talking about, right? So we're, we're driving a motor response via an auditory system mm -hmm. occurs on these sort of multiple distributed networks of both cortical and subcortical um, areas. And then when we think about MS, where we really have very little clinical research right. to even right. show that this works, is it hypothesized or, I mean, similar mechanisms and why it works in MS as why it works in PD as why it works in stroke? Or do you think that there's sort of unique reasons in each of these DC states why that might work? Yeah, I mean, such a great question. I think that the motor pathways are going to be affected in very different ways, mm -hmm. even in a spinal cord injury. But if you take above the neck and you take what you said, cortical or subcortical, mean the surface of the brain or deep in the brain or the cerebellum. There's a circuit that connects all of these to make a fluid, quote unquote, normal gait pattern. 
whether it's MS or whether it's Parkinson's or whether it's a stroke in the cortex in that superficial or deep part of the brain, those to me are merely locations. Those are lesion specific, right? Areas. So I don't have the answer. Uh, I certainly don't. And a lot of people smarter than me that do the, do the research are still looking for the answer. But I think that, um, you know, if you can, the theory is at least that if you can target the loop with the stimulus, then you're halfway there, then you can show efficacy. And that's why I think music and a lot of the stuff that the music therapists do works, right? It's almost like physical therapy. A lot of people do physical therapy, maybe not as targeted to a specific disease pattern, but the outcome is that they're improved with their gait. Right, right. Well, thanks for that, Ron. We went, we went, uh, I like to have the opportunities uh, in these interviews to go a bit deep into the neuroscience a bit. So appreciate the perspective there. I want to weave a, a, a bit out a, a little higher level here and talk a bit more about the things that you've been involved in in your career. Music has actually been a yeah. common theme, right? Uh, throughout your career, even as a, as a physician, right? Um, including, you know, obviously, in, I guess, five years ago now, we co-founded this, uh, this arts and neuroscience group at uh, the American Congress of, of Rehab Medicine, which is you know, the premier advocacy organization for rehabilitation medicine um, yeah. and has thousands of members around the world. You know, when you brought that idea to me and said, you know, hey, this, I would really like to do this thing um, mm -hmm. and really pioneering this group there, why was, why was that important? And specifically through ACRM, why was that, a, you know, a, of interest to you? Yeah, I think it was such a, it was such a great thing to, to build together. And, and um, I think it was, a, it was inter of interest because ACRM, I think it's been around for more than 100 years, mm -hmm. um, is, uh, they're really unique because th this is an organization that actually comes together on, back to what you were just talking about, a diagnosis, stroke, brain injury, spinal cord injury multiple sclerosis, neurodegenerative diseases. It doesn't come together on a group of physiatrists, a group of neuro, you know, neurologic music therapists, right? We're kind of fun to hang out with, with each other, but you know, after three days of just a bunch of NMTs, come on, hey, come on. a bunch of physiatrists. So, <laughs> but, 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 but I mean, you know, that's just kidding. But the, the, the fact is, is that it's all disciplines that come together for the same reason. So it's like, if you had a, um, a cancer conference, you didn't have an oncologist conference. See what I mean? Right. So it's, you know, that's what I think is, is so special about that organization. And so, so when it comes to the arts and neuroscience, um, you and I, you know, we both speak the same language. Music is what gets us up in the morning um, besides coffee and I guess a day job, but um, you know, music is a big part of our lives. And so we wanted to, I wanted to um, build on the research, build on the clinical um, uh, experience and, and, and show how, how can you, how can you grow this where it's, it's not only accepted, but it's part of the whole spoke of the wheel. So it's the speech therapist, the physical therapist, the music therapist. Mm -hmm. um, and then how, how, do you, um, how do you get it to be part of the, um, the regular conversation about recovery mm -hmm. rather than the regular conversation about recovery 20, 30 years ago was basically therapy and Ritalin, you know, or a, a, a medication. Right. So in, in other words, it, it, was a, it, was a it was a unique platform and we were really lucky, I think, to, to dive in. Absolutely. Yeah. How do you, how do we get this to become a standard of care, right? Like this is the yeah the standard group. of care is what I was searching right. for. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting yeah. too, because not only with that platform where we, you know, bringing together these interdisciplinary, uh, uh, well, disciplines in healthcare, OT, PT, speech, research, physiatry, uh, right. music therapy, but also music, right? Musicians and our, right. you know, our, our kickoff event was you know, live music with, uh, you know, live music and neuroscience presentation with Ben Foltz. You got to yeah. actually sit at a piano with him and play. Yeah. Yeah. I think we have a clip, Brian. Yeah. Oh, Can we roll on. that? You can't put no. me on the uh, no, uh, directors. <laughs> I've always wanted to say that. I know. Um, yeah, that was pretty cool. I mean, he is such an advocate for uh, 
the uh, the arts and, and recovery space and specifically music therapy. Um, and he's one of these people too that sort of he's a musician at heart, but he gets it. I think he comes to it from from the experience of like you know bringing joy and, and bringing and bringing experience to audiences over the years mm -hmm. and has, has seen it really affect uh, people in a very positive way. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we were really, that was great <laughs> opportunity. Yeah, it was an exciting time for sure. Um, you know, I'd, I'd love to dive in. You have a number of initiatives that you're working on outside of your work in the hospital, so to speak, um, that involve music. And, you know, these are realms of, we're at MedRhythms, we're hyper-focused on neuro rehabilitation, really hyper-focused on improving walking and movement following neurodisease and injury. But there's so many other ways that music is valuable in the lives of people, both uh, every day, but also therapeutically, right? And you're involved with a lot of these initiatives. Um, I would love to dive into a couple of those uh, with the time that we have left. Um, maybe even starting uh, about uh, you know the relevant topic over the last 18 months, two years yeah. just now has been COVID. Um, what were right. your initiatives that you've been working on uh, related to COVID and music? Yeah, so um, uh, let's see, April, was it uh, March, April 2020 when the, our Northeast was hit, um, starting to get hit, uh, the, the Boston Convention Center turned into, over a very quick period of time, a, uh, a, a field hospital for COVID patients that were not severely ill and intubated, you know, on a ventilator, um, but they were sick and they were weak and uh, they needed several days to weeks to get better. Um, so I was part of this team with Mass General, Spalding, Brigham and Women's, um, Beth Israel, uh, and uh, actually the military, um, uh, the, uh, the reserves came in and the National Guard, and it was this coalescence of people, um, doctors, nurses, therapists, psychologists, um, administration, who came together with like this mission over two months called, and, we, and it was called Boston Hope. And um, so uh, part of my role um, as chief medical officer during those few months were to think about how do we, from the rehab, wearing the rehab hat, um, how do we, how do we uh, offer different types of recovery to people um, as they're in this building 24 seven, no light coming in, um, and so we decided that, that music and dance um, and other types of, of, of arts and activity were going to be essential, of course, in addition to, you know, basically walking around a track, doing some exercise on a bike um, to, to fill their day. And so um, I teamed up with Dr. Lisa Wong, who you know well, um, and she, of course, we call her the corpus callosum of music and medicine. I mean, she just like connects everybody. And so she, of course, on the, on the outside, so to speak, of Boston Hope was able to connect with a lot of uh, musicians and music healing um, type of folks and, uh, or minded folks. And so we, we created something called Boston Hope Music that has still lived on, um, God, almost two, um, a year and a half, two years later. And uh, really what um, the focus is, is, is this, uh, it's the, is a nonprofit through Eureka Music and Windsor Music um, that were collaborators. So we're able to 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 uh, create something called musical doses, where we would uh, uh, they would record on YouTube um, a morning piece, a noon, and an evening piece. Um, evening calm, morning energy. I think uh, middle was the middle of the day was called engagement, and we would have prescriptions, and we would sort of give them, you know. Uh, music to uh, relax to or to energize during the day. Um, we also had musicians live and via Zoom uh, perform. We actually had Yo-Yo Ma uh, through, um, who had worked at MGH playing for patients and staff. Um, he piped into Zoom and played for Boston Hope, which was an incredible treat and honor. And he was an amazing uh, source of comfort as he always is. Um, and uh, anyway, it was, it was, it, was, it was great to infuse music into that hospital. Since then, we were able to, uh, we did some songwriting with, um, uh, with some of the patients. We also did, um, we worked with uh, uh, the New England Conservatory of Music. Uh, we're able to, with, through Dr. Kathy Tran, who's a hospitalist at MGH, she really um, took, uh, uh, spearheaded the idea 
and we uh, were able to pair New England Conservatory uh, teaching fellows one to one with doctors and some nurses. And over, they're still doing it. They're doing lessons uh, virtually. So the doctor becomes the uh, the student mm -hmm. and learns a new instrument. Um, and so it's it's been uh, it, it's it's been a real a real great collaborative effort, a great team of people. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm trying to think what else we did with that. Uh, we did some performances as well. We played at the vaccination centers. Mm -hmm. um, so even I did with you know Chuck Clow. Chuck and I yeah. played. Uh, I played piano, we played guitar, we played at Assembly Row. It's a great gig. Fine. You know, we played awesome. uh, played some covers. Amazing. Amazing. It's it's amazing to 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 hear also from your perspective, you know, in a time of such need for the world um, and really need for these patients that music was top of mind. Um, and this was something that was important to have for them, right? Um, yeah, it really was. Um, we'll talk about Ron, you know, some of the other work that you're doing, uh, songwriters with soldiers and what other, you know, what other ways are you weaving music into, into health? Well, you know, the, um, you bring up songwriting with soldiers, which is an amazing organization, um, that works with veterans. Um, and since 2012, they've written more than 500 songs and it's basically professional Nash Nashville based songwriters that connect with, um, veterans and they write these beautiful beautiful songs with lyrics that are come that are come from the emotions and specific lyrics from from the participants so um we we're able to do a study at home base which is uh, for veterans and uh for veterans and military families a, f a couple of years ago where we we took um we, we we had 10 10 veterans that actually had uh, uh written 10 songs so one-on-one -on -one. And we we were able to um, pair people together to write these just you know beautiful songs that were very cathartic for each person. And we studied it, and you know at the end of the day we could show that there was some decreased stress, um, decreased anxiety, and actual um, uh, decreased markers in in depressive symptoms um, after they listened to their own unique song that they created for four weeks as a dose or as a prescription. Um, and so that really, that was pre-COVID, of course, a couple of years ago. And then at Boston Hope, a friend and colleague of mine, who I've, I think you've met, Darden Smith, who's a singer-songwriter in Austin, Texas. Uh, he and I connected and said, you know, why don't we, we, we want to do something for the nurses specifically and other healthcare workers. So we, we started last year, a little more than a year ago. Um, something called Frontline Songs, where um, we basically, since that time, have written about 25 songs around the country at different hospitals and different centers where we have in-person or, or virtual four to six to eight nurses and doctors together that come together that, that either know each other or work on the same unit. And they start telling a story in confidence. They start, you know, there's tears, there's also joy, there's, there's a lot of discussions about what they're going through in COVID, um, it's traumatic. And so the songwriter is with them and takes the pieces of these emotions and they write this, they write this song together. It's collaborative songwriting. And after two hours, they come up with this like amazing song. I mean, they they really are great. Um, so I'm not here to, uh, to recruit or promote, but I, but I will tell you to, you know, check it out to, uh, if you're interested in the songs themselves frontlinesongs.com that's amazing that's amazing well, all right I, I am here to promote actually yeah, yeah. you can do that it's no problem. yeah that's no problem. Um, but it's really cool and i you know it's it's a passion and and uh you know we'll we we find that people are um are re really can show some healing through this collaborative effort so mm -hmm. yeah it's amazing and thanks for thanks for for doing that it's important work um to to think about the the carers Right, as much as we're we're thinking about the patients in these times, so that's appreciate right. the work that right. you're doing on that um, on that front. Um, all right, talk talk to me about we're going to talk about about music. Um, you're a yeah. wonderful pianist. What uh, what songs are you performing? What songs are you playing today? What songs are you listening to these days? Uh, gosh, I mean, I love um, I love I love playing. I actually just put finally put my keyboard out after a lot of dust in the closet. I, I do have a, a piano upstairs 
that I, I, I kind of noodle on occasionally. I love songwriting. I love playing chords and improvising. I play, I've played in a band for years. Um, and, uh, and so one thing I love to do is just to create music with other people live. Um, you know, whether it's a very simple song or not, and uh, kind of, you know, jazzy or rock uh, influenced stuff. Um, that's what really got me involved in, um, in the, you know, kind of building up the Boston music scene, because I'm far, I'm far from a professional musician, but I love it so much. And I, with Chuck, Chuck Clow and I um, played in a group together and said, you know, um, Chuck had an idea in 2016 to, uh, to start that, the podcast above the basement. And so through that, we were able to just connect with more musicians, actually play with other musicians. Um, and uh, he's really taken it to, to a great level. And um, so that, that's kind of like the, the you know, I don't know, that's kind of like my dopamine. You know, that's, that's what keeps right. me going is, is playing and also talking about music right. in that way. And you're, uh, you're usually on the other side of this uh, microphone. You're usually the ones that are, that are doing the interviews. Who are some of the interviews that you've done yeah, with yeah, yeah. At, uh, above the basement? Yeah, I mean, it's been a Boston-based, um, New England-based. Uh, we have branched out um, as well. We, you know, Chuck just republished uh, something interesting the other day. As a drummer, you'd appreciate this. Um, Wick Grousebeck, who is the uh, owner of the Celtics, mm -hmm. is in a drummer called French Lick. And um, he, uh, uh, it was a couple of years ago, we talked with him at the Celtics uh, training facility. It was really an interesting conversation about basketball and creativity and music and rhythm. And um, that, that stands out. Um, I don't know. There's a, uh, we've been really blessed to, uh, to talk with a lot of folks. Um, Chuck just recently talked with Juliana Hatfield. I wasn't there for that one. Um, local rap, um, hip hop, uh, several folks. Um we had an opportunity to talk with, speaking of drumming again, Mickey Hart from the Grateful Dead, which was diving into a lot of the history of music and how it connects to the brain. Um, I had a wild opportunity to uh, connect with Dr. Collins, Dr. Francis Collins, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, he just actually stepped down as an NIH director. And he, he he's all about how music connects people in the lab and, you know, he, he talked about how like discovering DNA and like, you know, how it was a collaborative effort and like, you can't do that. Like it's like a symphony and he had all these analogies and anyway, that was great. Amazing. <laughs> and of course, Lisa Wong and coming, coming soon, hopefully med rhythms with, uh, with Brian Harris and uh, Owen McCarthy. It would be, it would be an honor. We'd love, would yeah. love that run. Uh, would love that. So I guess as my uh, as my last question here, as you think about um, your career and the work that you've done with music and music and health and music in the brain, what does the future of this as a as a field look like? Not maybe not so much as a you know as music therapist, but like what is the future of music and health and music and, and neuroscience in your opinion? Yeah, gosh, I mean it's it's such a continuum. I mean it's so exciting to think about some of the the tech connections, of course, um, and specifically with what, what you guys are doing and sort of thinking about how software and the, this amazing age of like, of computer science and how that connects to make the delivery happen, right? And I, in some ways this is like so high tech, but in other ways, as you know, it's just the beginning. So I think that, you know, thinking about how granular and the amazing things that are going to happen, but also the pitfalls, I mean, that I can't even think about what it's going to be like in 25 years, as far as devices go. Um, the other thing I think about is, is kind of um, prescription medicine, or not precision, prescription medicine, um, precision medicine. So, you know, in recent years, it's really like talking about how our genetics, how our DNA really connect to our diseases, right? And so how are we going to how are we going to give a specific pill or a specific treatment to somebody with X, with Y? And so, you know, music, I think someday will hopefully join in that whole precision medicine pathway where you think about as you and I have riffed on before, different harmonies, melodies, timbres, uh, volume, um, um, melodies, different rhythms. What could be prescribed for something with a specific, somebody with a specific issue? That to me would be kind of like the holy grail of, of prescriptions. 
but I think kind of stepping back on like, you know, this interest that I did bring up about, you, we talked about, about songwriting is that I think there really is this kind of old school thing that has been utilized for, for centuries on how people come together and heal with, with collaborative um, singing and, uh, and music is just this stimulus, like we talked about at the beginning of the hour about those vegetative, poor vegetative folks that like music comes in and it resonates with them in some way. Mm -hmm. So I think always stepping back and thinking about how, you know, there's a lot of mystery out there. So like, you know, utilize it. Don't, don't, uh, I think the future of medicine and music is going to be more towards acceptance and more towards, you know, thinking outside the box. And that's, that is obviously exciting. Amazing. Terribly, terribly exciting. Um, in fact, it's, it's, very, it's an exciting time. I think, as you point out, the, the advancements of technology, the advancements of research, and now hopefully with more advocacy, um, music can be yeah. part of that prescription medicine, right? Or uh, precision medicine. Well, Ron, thanks so much for being here today. Questions. Um, that keyboard next to you, is it, is it plugged in, yeah. Ron? No. Uh, I, it, I could plug it in. Uh, do you have a time for a commercial? I would, well, here's this. I have some, I have a closing script. Let me say goodbye to our viewers and then perhaps uh, you could okay. play us out with a, with a tune. Uh, okay, um, hold on, I gotta plug it in. You did say you love improv, uh, Ron. So uh, while he's getting that set up, um, I wanna thank you all for joining us today. Um, it's been an honor to share the story with you um, and an honor to have Ron here with us. So thank you, Ron, for being here. And keep uh, an eye out for our next episode in November, um, where our next guest will be announced very soon. And as a reminder, if you'd like to watch this episode again, or you'd like to learn about med rhythms, you can check us out at our website, www.medrhythms.com. And thanks again for tuning in. Would that buy you enough time? Uh, I think so. Oh, geez. It's a strange sound. I think that was uh, some strings. Maybe we'll do a little Wurlitzer. What do you think? Let's do it. Let's do uh, it. And ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Ron Hirschberg. Um, I have no idea what to play, but um, maybe we'll do. Oh, Brian, it's so embarrassing. You should have planned this. I should have planned this. We, you said you love improv, Ron. Here we are. I know, exactly. You know what happened is that. My sustain pedal. Oh, there we go. Okay, here we go. Can you hear that? Sure can. Sure can. Um, you know, we could all we could always go back to a good old. My son Ben was saying he wanted to learn. Um, uh, he wanted to learn how to play the Snoopy's song, which he's like a 16 year old who's like a baseball player and basketball player, and I was very touched by the fact that he's gonna hate that I brought this up, but. You know this one. Is that a good way to end? That's a beautiful way to end. Well, thank you, Ron. Thanks for being with us. And uh, look forward to talking to you again sometime. And thanks for all the work that you have done and that you continue to do. So thanks, Ron. Brian, thanks so much for this. Uh, and this is a great series. So keep it up and uh, honored to be on Brains with Brian.